This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the app for arts and culture. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast where I talk to artists about the art, the literature, the music and film that have influenced them and continue to inspire them today and the cultural experiences that have shaped their lives and work. And in this episode, it's A Brush With, Sarah Z, an artist who takes objects and images and gathers them into intricate, uncanny assemblages which often envelop and overwhelm the viewer. Sarah's works are often categorised as sculpture installations, but exist on the boundary between many different disciplines, with painting, printmaking, drawing and video, alongside found and made sculptural elements. A first encounter with Sarah's work is never forgotten. She was born in Boston and studied at Yale University and the School of Visual Arts in New York, and before she'd even graduated from her MA, she made a pivotal work at MoMA PS1 in New York, setting her works within the walls and challenging the very fabric of the space. Sarah has an extraordinary knack of making her works directly embody a gallery space, seeming to grow from it and extend into it in surprising and even magical ways. Take her installation at the US Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2013. Here, she took point from the architecture as food for her imagination so that her sculpture grew from the design of the inlaid compass rose on the pavilion's floor into a multifaceted sculptural form alluding to a planetarium for instance. Sarah's Venice show was called Triple Point alluding to the point in which the temperature and pressure at which the three phases of a substance gas, liquid and solid coexist in thermodynamic equilibrium. It's the perfect metaphor for the fine balance of Sarah's work how it's mutable, permanently in flux and never at rest. In that Venice show's final room, it was as if the installation was pouring from the pavilion out into the Giardini and taking over the outside of the building. And she didn't stop there, placing rocks, or rather fake rocks, since they were photographs of stones wrapped around metal armatures throughout the city, on balconies, a newspaper kiosk, a boat carrying market produce, so that the work bled into the extraordinary environment of Venice. And some of Sarah's most notable works have been realised in public space. There was Corner Plot from 2006, in which the corner of a tower block in New York was reimagined to be emerging from the pavement below, its window containing a view into one of Sarah's assemblages below ground. Then there's the vast, dynamic, movement-filled drawings in white on blue tiles that fill the 96th Street 2nd Avenue station in New York. Then on New York's High Line, she seems to have miraculously apprehended speed in a two-part work that occupies either side of the raised walkway. And in LaGuardia Airport, she's created a glorious yet dizzying constellation of images of the sky above New York, caught in an intricate sphere that Sarah's likened to a mirage amid the terminal. At Storm King Arts Centre, meanwhile, also in New York, she's created Fallen Sky, a fragmented, reflective stainless steel sphere embedded in the earth that evokes clouds or continents, both solid yet, in its changing effects, intangible. At the heart of Sarah's work are marvellous contradictions. She seems to arrest unstoppable forces, almost freezing time, and yet she brings life and movement to inanimate objects. In recent years, painting has played an increasingly important role in her practice, and she's brought that same energy and restless activity to two dimensions. She's likened her paintings to portals, windows onto other spaces, and it's this idea with which I began our conversation. Is Sarah a creator of worlds, or does she reflect our own world back at us? I I think absolutely the first, you know, I never thought of portraying something, but actually thinking about how something behaves. So I think of the sculptures and the paintings about a kind of live behavior that you're watching um, rather than the depiction of behavior. So for example, if you think of them in terms of landscape, let's say, I think of them as a kind of portrayal of the behavior of landscape, how landscape grows, how it dies, you know, how entropy is inherent in everything that that is physical, um, much rather than trying to depict what something looks like. Um, I think also to have the work sort of self-reflectively reveal to you the behavior of the maker and, and see your own behavior in it live so that when you look at something that I've made, you're, you're actually having a kind of hopefully live experience 
of the putting together and the falling apart of a physical thing in front of you. And of course, time is fundamental, isn't it, to your work? All sorts of different ideas of time. But it's really notable that there's that piece in which you included a literal pendulum. And it seems to me that that's such an important symbolic part of that work and in general in terms of your work. Yeah, I mean, I think the pendulum for me is about also about measurement and the measurement of time. And so I mean, the place where I think a work usually for me stops is where it's really teetering between becoming and dying. Um, and so it's trying to kind of measure like, where you are in space, where you are in time. Part of the way I think the, the composition of a sculpture, an installation or a painting comes together is this idea that as you enter it, you are continually disoriented and then oriented. And that repeats itself over and over again so that your footing is never solid. The rug is pulled from underneath you. And I think that's interesting because I think you're potentially your senses are heightened in that state. And tell me about the, the earliest works, because there's this moment where you were making works with the most ephemeral of materials, with loo paper. Tell me about what, what happened there. So part of that was to take something that was completely disregarded for aesthetic reasons, you know, that was entirely practical, and to see if by putting one's hand in it and touching it and making decisions around it, it could feel live. It was, I was trying to kind of go for this very basic of ideas where um, you try and breathe life into an object. I had been a painter up until grad school, and that was actually kind of one of the first pieces I did that was not a painting. In some ways, it was very painterly. It was because it had nothing to do with gravity. It was on the floor. I'm always interested in what can you do in sculpture that you can't do in painting? What can you do in painting that you can't do in sculpture? So, you know, this sense of time, this sense of counting, of behavior, of dealing directly with the architecture and with the space were really important to me. But I think fundamentally, I wanted to see, to sort of push the material to such such a kind of throwaway material and then see if there could be breathed into it a new status, a new sense of value communicated through this material that we, we thought of as rubbish. That sense of things you can do or can't do with materials, it, it navigates such a sort of vital path in your work, doesn't it? Because it's there's that sense in which almost everything is in flux as a material, so that almost nothing behaves as it should behave in certain ways. Like things that should not be incredibly beautiful become incredibly beautiful through this process of transformation. Yeah, I mean, I think also there's a basic idea that everything is is fundamentally in a process of transformation. Like your shirt is degrading. You know, you're both of us, we're losing our hair. You know, things are or we're growing. It could be growing. But, you know, that we're in a process of, of becoming or losing um, at all times. And every object is as well. You know, and that every time we take an object and we make a decision to transform it in any way, it is a, um, a conversation with that object. Tell me about the, the sort of, it can't be quite described as a return to painting in your work, because there's always been elements of painting, but, but there's, there's certainly more painting in your work. And tell me about that and, and why it is that you feel that painting is a vehicle for your ideas in a way that perhaps it wasn't such a strong vehicle maybe a, a decade or so ago. Yeah, I mean... I was trained as an architect and as a painter, and I, I thought about doing architecture um, and then focused on painting. And the way that I was trained in painting was very academic. It was mostly, you know, painting from the figure, painting from life, and color theory, you know, sort of paired with Albert's color theory. And the environment was very competitive. It was very clear when everyone turned around their canvas, sort of who could do, you know, a rendering of the model you know, in one hour quite well. Um, and that became almost like an athletic activity for me, which I was quite good at, but I, I didn't have a content drive in it. And so when I went to graduate school with that, and I decided to just throw that all away to start from not using any of those skills. Um, but I think a lot of the architecture training, a lot of the painting training came together to meet in sculpture. And in some ways that was interesting because I had none of the baggage of what sculpture should be. Um, and so the installations were really came from a background of the language of architecture and the concerns of architecture and the concerns of painting. 
And then, of course, when you use video, what I'm always struck by, again, is that video occupies a space which seems in some way unstable in your work, the way that it's projected onto objects that it, you don't expect it to be projected onto. And so, again, it's almost like you're interrupting the state of every medium you use. Yeah, it's funny because I wanted to, I used video in my very early work in the 90s. My first show that I did at, um, in a museum ever was at the MCA Chicago and it had videos in it. And I was working with a friend of mine at the time who worked at Sony and I, we would go and we had these huge tapes and it was very expensive. We would do it after six o'clock when he was done. He just did it with me, you know, as a favor. And um, I couldn't do it. It was so hard to do logistically, financially, and it sort of fell out of the work. And now, you know, just what, 20 years later, you can make an entire you know, film on your iPhone. And so it, it came back both because of that, but also because of just the extreme acceleration of this barrage of images and the way we use images now. Um, and, and, and that the image in some ways is really like an object. You know, we trade them. We buy them, um, we can attain them, we make them, we use them to communicate, we confuse them with how we relate to objects. You know, like I might buy that shirt in real life, but there's a good chance you bought it online. And then when you get it, you have to rectify what color it was online to what it was. So our, our, that, that kind of confusion is really, I think, very much about how we're experiencing both the digital and the physical together and they're enmeshed really. So that became interesting to me again. Let's move on to the questions that we ask all our artists now. Who was the first artist whose work you loved? I'm going to answer it in two ways. The first thing I thought about, which I found interesting, was to think about what were the first artworks I ever saw. And, you know, I was born in 1969. And um, something I, that I think is really nice about that time is posters were very popular. And people would take posters of, you know, a Monet or whatever, a Warhol, and they would just tack them to their wall. So I grew up in a house um, where there was a poster of Le Corbusier and a poster that I'll tell you who the artist is afterwards because it's interesting. And then there was actually a Chinese scroll that we had in the house. And all of them, I actually remembered this, that I saw them all before I knew how to speak and how I knew how to read. The one that I left the name out of, I always liked it as an abstract image. And when I learned how to read, I realized it was Robert Indiana's love. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly one day saw it and I realized, oh, it actually has words in it, which is kind of very interesting also to me, juxtaposed with the Chinese scroll. It's actually seal script, which is the most ancient Chinese script, which is actually, you know, even if you speak basic Chinese, probably can't read it. Um, but that was really my first experience with realizing, oh, that's actually not just a work of art. I, I'm actually reading it as a work of art and as language. But the first, I think, piece of work that I saw in person, not in reproduction, I think I would say it's Vermeer. Um, and I was very lucky because I had a series of really wonderful um, oil painting teachers when I was very young. And they would take us to museums and to painting like en plein air out in, you know, on the beach or in, in actually often in the graveyards <laughs> where we painted. Um, but I used to go to the Isabella Stort Gardner Museum and there was a beautiful Vermeer there called The Concert, which very sadly actually was stolen, yeah. which is you know, a complete tragedy. And now you go back and they have this sort of, it almost looks like an um, Alan McCollum sort of black sheet over it. But it was and is just a phenomenal painting where, like most his paintings, for me, I think one of the things I learned from him was this kind of speed of going from the mundane to the profound, whether it was you know, pouring milk or looking through the music sheets. But then you'd have this evidence of, you know, the painting within the painting, the map within the map, and would almost always flow to the upper left to an open window. Whether you could see the window or not, you could see that there was this option to sort of escape and it created this air. It was always natural light pouring into the space from the upper left side. And so this sort of speed of going from the minutia of the everyday to the potential and the, the possibility of the world around you, which I also think was very much about Holland in this kind of you know overpopulated, restricted place, Flanders at the time. And then this potential, because you would see all, all of these goods also that they had obviously gathered from Persia and Indonesia and and you'd see them gathered. So it was this kind of amazing intimacy and then this amazing 
kind of um, openness to the world around you. I know you, you've talked about that sort of sense of scale in Vermeer, but I wonder if, if, if is it something that you, that you can actually feel a direct correlation with in your work? Because obviously the scale is so important in your work. So do you literally think of Vermeer when you're actually thinking about scale and about that sort of balance in his work? Yeah, I mean, I really do. I, when I did the Venice Biennale, the last room in the pavilion was actually very much devoted to him because I made a square that you looked outwards and I thought very much about creating locations where you're really looking like a tiny pebble and then your eye would move and look, you know, move to the sky and would shoot out very, very quickly and, you know, into the distance. Which historic artist do you return to the most today? I think it's related, entirely different part of the world and time frame. But I, there are two that I was thinking of for this. One is Hokusai. I mean, the Hokusai series, this 36 series of Mount Fuji, was had a huge impression on me. And I just think this idea of, it was almost like using the image as a, a sculpture in, a, in the round, because Fuji is like this compass point for all of these different moments, right? So you, so mm. you see the world, but you're always anchored by some relationship to Fuji. So you really physically are turning in space, almost like looking at a Bernini, Daphne and Apollo, where you say, there's one place in the world, but my perspective to that is gonna change it entirely. And then, you know, things like, you know, a sudden gust of wind, that, that classic image that Jeff Wall used as well, yeah. you know, and I actually used it in my subway station. That's a, that was a reference there. It's kind of blowing and, you know, the paper in the wind. One of the beautiful things about printmaking is, that, you know, an ukiyo-e printmaking, so ukiyo-e means um, images of the floating world, is that they use the white of the paper, they use the material of the paper itself as the white. And it's this kind of, it's an entirely different process about composing an image because you have to do all of the red at once across the entire image, right? So you build the image in flats. And, and that kind of perspective making is, has had a lot of influence on me. And the second artist I was going to talk about was Fan Quan, who is a um, Chinese landscape artist. Um, and there's a painting that I think is just one of the most phenomenal paintings I've ever seen, which is called Travelers by Mountains and Streams. And in both of those works, the landscape has this kind of unbelievable, you know, the hoax I and, and this in different ways unbelievable presence and the human is this tiny tiny you know person you know barely clothed you know with animals you know doing very very mundane things and there's usually three kind of perspectives classically in Chinese painting where you have you know you have a large perspective a tiny perspective and a middle ground and the middle ground is often actually just mist or air and so again it's this kind of shooting that I talked about with Vermeer where you shoot from this very very small place to this kind of sublime, you know, incredible, overwhelming sense of nature, which is very, very different than the way landscape is depicted in a lot of, you know, Western painting where the horizon line is very set, you know, one point perspective, you know, this mountain in this painting is, is very sexual, it's very lush, it, it's extremely abstract, you know, it barely looks like it could be a natural thing. Um, and I think depicting nature in all of its idiosyncratic ways is something that Chinese painting does so well, because when you actually examine, and I've actually drawn that painting, and it's a shape that you can't even imagine would exist, and then it works as a painting. And of course, you've, you've actually used that title in your own work, haven't you? Yes. Travellers by Streams and Mountains. Yes, I, still, I, I like to steal titles. I, I often <laughs> steal from writers, because, you know, they're wordsmiths. <laughs> they're going to do it well. <laughs> Obviously, because you're engaging with this sort of unbelievable piece of work that you're talking about, when you're using that title, do you think twice? Is it something that you, you know, you're thinking, well, okay, it's appropriate to use that here, you know, or do you want to encourage the kind of the reference to be picked up? In a way, titles can be a negotiation or a, or a conversation with the with the viewer, but they're also a sort of a negotiation with your own thoughts, right, as well. Yeah, I think, you know, I think sometimes if things are too close, you don't want them to be. But I feel like this is actually, for most of the people who are looking at my art, they're not actually going to get that association. So they look it up and that can spur a chain of conversation. Like, so, I mean, I'm having a conversation with this work of art, which is amazing over time, right? So I'm sort of allowing that to happen. Um, and to think of it, you know, I love the idea of words being taken out of context too, and then reinvented, which is a very... You know, it's a very poetry idea. It's a very hip hop idea. This kind of idea of sampling, where you mm. sample something and in in its new context, 
it gains a new kind of power. And tell me about, I mean, obviously you're talking about the sudden gust of wind there. So much of your work is about suspension, about holding things in apparent movement. Yes. Tell me about that, because that must be one of the, the ways in which you relate to that work. Again, going back to this idea of how does something become live? I was thinking, you know, what is valuable to us in life? You know, if, if there's a fire, the first thing you're going to take out is the people, then maybe the animals, and then the art. You know, that's probably the next thing you take out. And and this is an incredible idea that that you can breathe life into an object. So that an object becomes so valuable because so much of someone's life has been actually somehow conveyed into it, or perhaps, you know, the experience of being alive on earth has been conveyed into that object, that non-living object, to make it actually imbue a kind of life is a kind of incredible idea. And so to me, it was always this question of how do you make something live? So something that is in movement, something that can change at any second, you know, something that, you know, like live performance, I wanted to sort of breathe live performance into the work in a surprising way. I wanted to talk about futurism because this obviously relates to what you were just saying there because obviously in the Highline piece you you said that Bala was an influence on that because it does very much appear that you've arrested something in movement that you've somehow caught speed and it seems to me again that that's an amazing reference and of course what so many of those artists of the futurism and, and, and you know the sort of early 20th century period are trying to do. You know I think that what's interesting about that time with Russian constructivism and futurism is it was a time where our sense of speed or their sense of speed at the time was accelerated from, you know, before the airplane, you know, before the car, before the train, like our whole sense of what it was as a human being to be able to move in time and space got massively accelerated. And I think we're in that stage now. And so I think that the idea that there would be parallels in artistic movements makes a lot of sense. But I think that, again, back to this idea of trying to describe, if you will, a kind of behavior rather than to illustrate it. So, you know, you can jump quickly from, you know, from the futures to the cubists, right? Like to really describe what it is to see an object with your eye. Your eye is always moving. You know, the object is in movement. In your peripheral senses, there's a movement. So like the idea of a still image is entirely a fiction, right? So that I think to me is very interesting to even break down what it is to see something, what it is to experience something through your senses. Um, And I think even more so now when you go see things live, your senses are really heightened because of where we are in terms of, you know, seeing so much and, and feeling as if we're experiencing so much fully while we're not experiencing it fully because there are physical things like a plastic screen. So it's not digital, it's actually physical, but we're not, I can't smell the room you're in. I don't know what temperature it is. You know, all of these things that we know actually affect memory, I think most importantly, but also dreams, hopes, like it's those kind of interior images that actually I think now for me are most interesting is that people forget that, you know, so much of what we see is outside our eyes, but actually we're constantly having images in our head. Like when you come on the screen, I'm thinking, oh, that's what he looked like? I thought he looked like this. And that image of you, whether it is is in my head, right? So that, you know, we're constantly negotiating interior images. There's this beautiful thing I learned um, in dance in in Japan. Um, It's a quote by Kazuo Ono. He was one of the leaders of Butoh dance. And he said that there are three spaces in the world. And in Butoh dance, you put a lot of white all over your face. And all of your orifices turn into these kind of black holes. And he said there are three spaces in the world. There's the skin, there's everything outside the skin, and there's everything inside the skin. And so this idea that like a third of of, of yourself is the skin and and a third of yourself is interior shifts this whole balance in that we tend to think that anywhere between 90 to 100 percent of what we experience is actually outside our eyes. So that's something I'm really interested in in the work. Let's talk about contemporary artists. Which contemporary artists do you most admire? So, of course, like that's an incredibly hard question, but I just saw the Jasper John show, which is phenomenal. 
Um, I think a lot of people relate my work to Rauschenberg, which I love, but I also think John's, if not as much or more, as someone I, I learned a lot from, think a lot about, um, and this cross between sculpture and painting, you know, even from the most basic idea of having this kind of playfulness with the black silhouette jar that has the, you know, the face on the side, you know, this simple thing of saying, I'm an image, I'm not an image, you're making me into an object, I'm not an object. Um, and then to, to paint objects, to paint a flag, to paint a, um, a target, to paint a can of brushes, and say, you know, that paint is a material that we can build a sculpture out of paint, um, fundamentally. And I, you know, I think that show really has these strong points and lineages to some other works that I think are phenomenal, like Warhol, uh, particularly Warhol's car crash series. The Death and Disaster, yeah. Death and Disaster, thank you. And the um, electrocution chair, you know, where the image is the piece, right? The image is the object. There's a found objects that are actually the thing itself. They're just recontextualized. And Duchamp, obviously, who, you know, of course does this with, with the ready-made. So that show is really interesting to see those lineages go into Jasper's work as really phenomenal work. And as a, a real contemporary of, of mine that um, whose work has affected mine and also co I've collaborated with um, is a dancer choreographer named Trajal Harrell. And he and I met in college and we met actually in Craig Owen's postmodernism class, which was an amazing class that I think affected us both and have ever since had um, a very strong artistic dialogue and, and sort of a support of one another as artists and have done several collaborations. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you're talking about John's there. And of course, John's too had that very strong relationship with choreography in terms of Merce Cunningham and everything yes. else. Yeah. I mean, the cross-pollination of different media are so key to your work aren't they but yeah. it's also about learning from other disciplines right so so that you, there are modes of creativity which happen in different fields that somehow can apply to the visual arts even if they're not obvious uh, i mean absolutely i don't think they can they just do you know i think they're i think people forget that you know the senses are not separated we don't just see things right so i was thinking also with trodgel's work too about sound and all of my work there's sound you know i'm interested in cage i'm interested in silence. I'm interested in creating silence by having sound and then dropping the sound so that you actually hear the silence and to play with a lot of found sound. So all of the pieces sort of orchestrate sound. A lot of the sound has to do with sound that's made in the making of the piece. So it's almost like the piece itself is a machine. The piece itself is a tool. It's, you know, the piece itself is burping and speaking and like revealing its, its, its past to you right there. So, but those are carefully sort of choreographed to create moments of crescendos and silence. Another artist who recently passed away, who I thought was, was such an important artist on many levels, but for me in his really early work as Chris Burden in his performance work, you mm. know, this idea um, that you could do something that nobody saw and that almost in its story afterwards had this kind of power and this legacy and this myth. You know, when I did the American Pavilion, I had this, everyone goes to the American Pavilion. I was very lucky because the next year I, I was kind of oddly, but very like appreciatively invited back to do this very, very remote garden. And I love the idea that it was a place where maybe someone would see it and maybe someone wouldn't. But, and when you went there, you knew that, you knew that it can be just this chance occurrence that you found it. And that actually the value of that experience was heightened by this discovery and by this uniqueness of that experience. And that's something I think Chris, you know, somebody, he did a piece where he just put like a burning cross in the middle of a, a road and like left it there. Didn't know if anyone would see it. Just returning to John's a bit, one of the things I've always admired in your work is the sense of mark making, even in sculptural objects. So that, for instance, it might be a toothpick or it might be a piece of tape or, or whatever. And John's, of course, is this absolute master of mark making. And, 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 you know, it's almost an unfathomable thing to explain. But there is something sort of magical in that application of paint and the, in, in those gestures, those marks, right? Yeah, I think one of the things that's interesting to see the show is I think he almost has a palette of marks that, and I feel like this myself, a palette of marks, and that mark can be silence, that mark can be a toothpick, that mark can be a color of paint that you like. 
Um, but we know this, he has these repetitive, very intimate, and you know, they have this kind of urgency that you don't know why they are there. Like, you know, the, the young boy or the crisscross marks, you know, or as I, I explained the, you know, the vase that comes out of mm. two profiles, but they have a kind of urgency to him that somehow comes through. I love that about art. I feel like when there's an urgency in the making of the work, or there's a serendipity in something coming together, that is actually conveyed somehow through inanimate materials to the viewer. And so there's this kind of real intimacy that's surprising in his work because it, he doesn't necessarily give you the reason why it's intimate. But the mark is so lovingly, so tenderly applied with such precision. Because so much of your work seems to evoke the studio sort of exploding I'm imagining that you have lots of imagery around you accumulating in the studio but is that the case what do you have pinned to the studio wall so that's a funny question for me because I have so much pinned to the studio wall all the time and it changes radically all the time um, and I think that's even part of what became part of the paintings you know when I came into the studio to say like wait this entire studio everything on the walls is is a work and how can you bring that in which is something i was doing in sculpture anyways i'm really interested in collapsing the experience of the studio space the making of the work and the place where you see it so that when you go into a, a non studio space like a museum you feel this kind of intimacy of walking into someone's studio and i do think i would much rather go to john's studio than to go to the show i mean much not because there's there's an incredible collection of his works there but you know, I love studio spaces. I love going to see even historical, like Emily Dickinson's house or Anne Frank's house, even if there's nothing there. I love being in the place where things were made. And so using the walls to kind of translate into the work actually was something I did in the paintings. I mean, the walls for me are really, I use them like storyboards, you know, so I really think about what is going on. I remember um, Matthew Barney had me over to his studio and it was just storyboards like because he was making a film. And I thought, oh, this is actually what I'm doing. I, I realized I'm doing this too. Like, so if I'm doing a space, I'll take, you know, I'll get hundreds of pictures of that space, put them all on the wall and then I'll just draw into them, which is also probably from architecture, right? So I'll draw into the space what I'm going to do even before I'm there to imagine it. Um, so all of that material started becoming part of the work too. You know, if you look at the paintings, there'll be like a calendar of what the show was supposed to, you know, the tickets from where I flew there. There'll be a photograph of the painting in an early stage. Cause this is something that I think is interesting that artists are doing all the time, um, which is, you know, you sit down with an artist and they pull out their iPhone and they show you, this is what I was doing in my studio today. That, I mean, the, num <laughs> the amount of archiving of, the process of making work has become so, so massive, right? Yeah. And so that I thought was even interesting, the work. So I would take a photograph of a painting and then put it back in the painting. So many people are like, is that a photograph in your painting? And I'm, often it is, but it's of the painting. So it has this kind of, it shows the histories of the levels of the painting, and then they're kind of puzzled back into the paintings. So in answer to your question, the walls and the work are one, I think, in many ways, and they change radically. And that change, I don't even see. It's when people come to my studio in one week, they're like, wait a second, everything is different here. Uh. But, you know, there'll be pictures of planetariums, of scientific instruments, you know, things that I'm referring to for, uh, for research. You know, anything goes. This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the app for arts and culture. The app offers access to more than 40 cultural institutions through a single download, with new partners being added every month. There's a huge variety of institutions on the app, each with an individual guide. There are botanical gardens, artist foundations, sculpture parks, historic museums and cutting-edge contemporary spaces. In New York alone, there's everything from the Museo del Barrio to Central Park Conservancy, the Frick Collection, the Guggenheim Museum and the Judd Foundation. Foundation. In the guides, you can discover unique audio content and podcasts, hear from artists and curators in exclusive videos, explore exhibitions past and present, and plan your visit in advance. To explore the guides to all the partnering institutions, download Bloomberg Connects today. You can find the app at bloombergconnects.org, and it's also available to download from the App Store and Google Play. Which museum or gallery do you visit most frequently? So I think, you know, because I'm mostly in New York, the gallery that I frequently visit is the Met. 
and there's there's just because there's nothing like going from a Gandharan sculpture to the tomb of Perneb to an incredible Rembrandt and having that one after the other. And there's also this feeling that I will go there for a show, but you can always go back. You never feel hungry. I think as an art lover, when you go out to see art, there's this expectation of eating an incredible meal. And then, and if you go, you know, sometimes you go to galleries and you just don't feel like you, you've, you're filled. And the Met, there's just no way you can't walk in there immediately and be filled. So because I'm in New York, I think that's the place I go the most. But when I lived in Venice, I went to museums the most. So when I lived in Venice for the Biennale, I used to go to the Academia like almost every day. And it's an incredible group of paintings. And one of the things I loved about it was they do the restoration on site. So it was also like a studio space. Like you saw how paintings are living objects. It was incredible. You saw how like these crazy substructures that some of them were built on and, you know, or how people had cut off the top because they wanted to fit in the door. And you, so you see them as living objects, right? And because they don't want to move them out of the museum to change, you know, the environment, the weather, the climate, they actually set up like a box around where that painting was in that room and you see people working on it. So it, it's the museum as a live studio. The other place that I loved was um, the Peggy Guggenheim because I love going to museums where the work is was actually, like I love the Frick, I love the Isabella Stork Gardner Museum where the museum itself, again, is is the housing for the objects and, and you see the like collection as it built within the space, which has to do, again, with this idea of um, not separating a painting from its environment, you know, of really thinking, you know, when I said that everything was pinned to my walls, it's actually not dissimilar to the timekeeping series I do where the architecture becomes like a planetarium, right? The, the screen, there's no screen. The screen is the architectural space itself. And the last place I'll say is in Venice to go to the Frari, and see, you know, see the Titians on site. I mean, I would go there all the time. Mm. And to see how they were in such sophisticated ways painted into the architecture, this is the ascension of, at the front, but then there's the Madonna and the Pissarro family to the left. And if you stand in a certain uh, angle, you see actually the architecture on an angle, you see how the uh, columns actually reach back into the painting. I love this marriage of, of of painting the space, and I don't see them as separate. That's right. I mean, there's a sense, especially in Venice, isn't there? Of course, in all historic cities, but wonderfully, there was such an important negotiation with space by those artists. They were making those specific works, and so many of them still remain, like San Giovanni and Paolo too. You know, there's also that great Titian in the Jesuati, which is just amazing. amazing. So there's a, so it's just that sense of, as you say, environment and painting are one, and and that's they're installations of. Well, of but also you think about Michelangelo and Leonardo. They were, you know, they were architects. And they were architects, they were painters, they were sculptors, they did everything, right? That was expected of them. A lot of people say to me, wait, how are you doing painting? How are you doing sculpting? You know, this was a complete norm. I mean, one thing that I found interesting, I was doing a little research after doing some of the paintings I'm doing now um, about landscape, is that landscape in the Renaissance was considered a pretty low art. There, were, there was actually kind of a, a hierarchy. I think Alberti wrote it out, a hierarchy where it was multiple figures in you know deep space, was like the top and then portraiture and then skill life and like landscape was considered a low art. And, you know, in Asian art, landscape was always considered like the ultimate. And so I actually think in many ways it has a, it's a much more sophisticated, much more developed over centuries and centuries as being the art that people aspired to be the, the landscaped artist. Which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? They're really experience of travel for me. Um, and they sort of happened um, at different stages in my life, I think. So in 1986, I went to China. I went to Xi'an and saw the Terracotta Warriors. Um, and that I realized actually when I looked it up, it was only about 10 years after they were discovered by a farmer at that time. And it's mind boggling, as you can imagine. Sure. Um, so that was that, that I think was very transformative for me. I went to Japan and lived in Japan actually for a year. I went several times during college and then I lived there afterwards for a year. And I would say Roanji 
is something that everyone should see. I learned so much about negative space, about, as I said, the idiosyncratic nature of landscape and how do you create that? How do you create negative space? How do you create ritual? Um, how do you frame a landscape? Because you have to go there to see that you sit in back and it's a dark space and the landscape is light. So it's almost like, it's almost like a screen. It's almost like watching a movie. Um, and it's silence like you've never heard before. <laughs> um, and then the second place there that, that I really learned a lot from was King Kakuji, which is the golden temple. And what I, I think this idea of wandering became very important to me, um, a composition of wandering, whether that's architecturally, uh, sculpturally, or in painting. And one of the things that I learned there was that the entire way that you walked through space, even the way the path was set up was made so that when there was a step, you had to look down. And when you looked up, there was actually a composed image of, you know, a small landscape against a very far landscape, but you didn't necessarily even know it. It was like kind of, you know, knitted into this experience of discovery so that it, it mirrored this idea of when you're hiking and you you run into a flock of birds, right? So it was mirroring this kind of surprise incidents. And to me also, it was very filmic. It was very much about they had choreographed that space, almost like a film. Like there were these like stills that you were supposed to encounter one after the other. It was very narrative in this way that you felt like you found things, but it was in entirely choreographed. Recently, I've gone to India a lot. I have family in India now, but my first time in India was in the late 90s. And I would say three places there, if you ever go to India, you need to go to obvious. One that seems very obvious is the Taj Mahal, but to see it in real life is entirely different because what you don't realize is it's actually cloistered behind many, many courtyards that have very, very deep alleyways. So you, it's almost like a camera aperture. And this has to do, I think I learned a lot about the portal through it and that you walk, you see it like this tiny little image, like a mirage, you see the building and it's really bright and you walk through this dark tunnel and then you walk into a light courtyard and you walk. So it's almost musical too, because it expands light and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you come. And when you come out, it's just spectacular. And what you don't realize also from the pictures is that behind it, there's a very wide river. So it's backlit by light off of water, which is like, like that's why we love Venice. You, you realize that everything is lit by light off of water. And then this classic Mughal idea of these low um, waterways that reflect the building down to the earth. So it entirely loses its weight. So that is an incredible experience in real life. And I learned a lot about how to kind of choreograph an experience over time and space from that. Um, the other two places are Junter Munter, which is less known, which is, there are two of them, but there are two of these celestial parks. Um, but they are these incredible, really beautiful, actually sculptural objects that were built so that you could walk into them and, and measure the stars above you. And the last one is, are these step wells that are just phenomenal engineering feats and also really beautiful social ideas, because the idea was that the water would be accessible to a larger public. So they're literally upside down pyramids that people walk down to this little waterway. But it allows, you know, hundreds of people to get to the water and they're mind bogglingly beautiful. And you've actually you talked about the step wells in connection with your own work. Was it the Venice work, in fact, that you did for 2015 that you've talked about it in relationship to? Well, I just did this piece at um, Storm King, and it goes down into the earth. So Junter Munter, the wells, this idea of creating um, a sculpture that is about taking negative space out of the earth. Um, there are these places, Junta and Alora, which are also these temples that are built you know, by carving back into a mountain and creating the sculptural object out of the materials that is taken out. And that idea has been really important in things that I did this piece at LaGuardia, to this large piece at um, Storm King, where actually they're both nesting negative spaces. So what is not there is is forming what's there, actually. And they're both sort of many, many pieces that your eye puts together to make this kind of iconic whole. Um, but there is actually no large structure there. Which writers or poets do you return to? 
Emily Dickinson is always my go-to. I mean, I could pick that up and read it any day. Um, and I pretty much have memorized so much of it that I can also just come up with it if I need it. And like, you know, I want it on an airplane and I want to recite. So that's been a real gift. But, you know, there are others, Elizabeth Bishop, Yates, Blake, Frank O'Hara, Wallace Stevens, the Persian poet Hafiz, the Irish poet uh Nick Laird, who lives in London. But Emily, as I've stolen many, many of her words to use as titles. And actually, I went to her house in Amherst. And um, it was very interesting to see, as I said, I love seeing these places, even if it's just the desk. But one of the things that was interesting, it was actually her second house, but in her first house, which was demolished, her desk actually overlooked the town graveyard. And so she saw all of these funerals happening. She literally sat at her desk every day. And I found that to be really interesting. And it also reminded me that I, I had actually learned how to paint in a graveyard. <laughs> um, I felt a kind of connection to her through that. But for books, you know, some contemporaries that I'm really lucky to both speak to and read their work. So Zadie Smith, I think, you know, is one of the greatest writers of our generation. I mean, I love her essays. I love her books. I've been lucky to have her write about my own work and she was amazing when she came to write about my work she i don't know how she feel about me telling you this but it's a good story she <laughs> came to the studio and she said okay thanks now you can go away and i left and she said i, I checked in on her a few times you know water or whatever she was like kneeling down and she just had a notebook and a piece of paper and she's just scribbling away madly and like after, I don't know, an hour or two, she said, okay, I'm done. I'll, I'll see you later. I mean, we're friends. Like I know her. So I was like, okay. <laughs> she, so she left. And in about two days, she handed in this unbelievable essay. You know, unheard of for writers. You know? <laughs> I, can, um, I can speak to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, and so she had this kind of incredible, she just wanted to be immediate with the work in this kind of very different way than a lot of art critics are. So that was really nice. The second person I was going to talk about was um, Jennifer Egan, who is also a friend and has come to my studio many times, um, who is unbelievable in that she can actually change up her style for every single book she writes. And, you know, the Goon Squad, Manhattan Beach, like picking them up is just, uh, for me, they're the books that, you know, you get sad when you're towards the end of them because you're you're in the <laughs> state that you know you're just going to end. Um, so I'm lucky to have those two as living in the same lifetime that I am. Um, you mentioned Emily Dickinson and, and of course, that you, and that you've taken titles from her, including the work in LaGuardia, right, which is called Shorter Than the Day. And that's directly yes. a quote from. Yes. But it's also a, a quote from a, a poem which is about death. And, and yes. you know, again, yes. So, you, yes. you know, it's fascinating. You know, that I guess, again, we talked about time earlier on. The, the sense of time in Dickinson's poems is extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, all of her poems are about death. Yeah, there's some love loss, but that basically leads to death. Um, and, and yeah, I remember I sat down to, when, when I was in Venice, I sat down with Eric Fischel and I, he said, what do you think your work's about? And I said, death. And he said, what? <laughs> I mean, I think most artwork is about death, you know, because I don't know if I need to even explain that. Yes, I think all of her works about death. When they did the publicity for that, they did leave out like the rest of the poem. <laughs> It's because right when you're getting on an airplane, it's not the first thing you want to think about. But um, I, I love the idea of shorter than the day just because, and again, it's this idea of how you can take something out of its context and use it in a way that has a different kind of poetry. This is such an incredible idea that when you get on a plane, you whatever, six hours later, you land up in a different time zone in a different part of the world and that your the whole sense of time is readjusted. So that's why that title was... But I keep her capitalizations and her lower cases in this kind of strange, um, very specific ways that she uses words so that if you, when you look at them, if you want to sort of put those pieces together, you can, but you don't have to. Um, what music or other audio do you listen to while you work? So I listen to, you know, I would say like when I really need an open, calm space, I listen to Chopin Nocturnes. My grandmother was a um, pianist and that was her favorite. And she used to always play it every night. My mother went to bed to it, but I never met her. She passed away before I, I was born. So that has meaning for me. But I love to dance. So uh, if I'm in the mood for dancing, then I'll put on Prince or like early hip hop, like Queen Latifah or even something more contemporary like Outkast. I think the thing that stays with me the most is jazz. So one of the things I do to my iPhone is I change all the rings because I can 
why would anyone put up with hearing these same rings all the time? It's so easy to do. So I put a little bit of music to like different people's rings. And the only one that I can actually hear over and over again is jazz. That's interesting. The other ones become annoying or, you know, I can listen to jazz forever. So if it was like a Desert Island disc question, it would have to be like Billie Holiday, you know, maybe John Coltrane, Miles Davis, Dizzy Gillespie as, you know, Dexter Gordon, um, but probably Billy. One of the things about doing these interviews, which is so interesting, is that jazz comes up time and again. And I'm, you know, of course, I'm sort of wondering what what is it about jazz, the particular qualities of jazz, different forms of jazz, whether it's improvisation or or song based stuff. But it does seem to have a sort of mode which seems to help artists. It seems to me. That's interesting. I think it might be part of it that that you hear the conversation. I also listen to a lot of Indian classical music because of my Indian family. Mm. And it's fascinating. It's really a conversation, the work, right? You hear the the liveness in it, right? You hear that one person says something and the other person responds. It's a call and response, fundamentally a call and response. <laughs> and then you have the solo where they get to, where you actually hear them say, Well, let me tell you this, <laughs> you know, and so that kind of live conversation in the moment is so fundamentally part of the structure. Mm. It's also in Indian classical music. And um, uh, I think maybe that's why, you know, other music has that, but this is fundamentally it's DNA is that call and response is the liveness. What other media influence your work? You know, it would have to be film. I think Chris Marker's La Jete was hugely formative to me. And I saw it actually in high school. Um, and obviously it's this incredible film in that it's not a film and it is a film. It's, you know, it's all stills. It plays with time. It's a film that is a timekeeper in and of itself. And that had a huge impact on me. That like that the idea of a series of timekeeper pieces that I was making was how do you make a piece that in itself is kind of trying to keep sense of time. Agnes Varda, Cleo from seven to nine is also a you know a classic piece where it starts at five and it ends at nine. And so it's really trying to track, you know, the passing of time. And so the work I'm interested in right now is actually to play with that confusion of the passage of time. So I just did this work where I basically made a bunch of images, like a set of cards, and then let about half of it be coded and half of it be choreographed by me. So you have an intersection. So for me, it's live all the time. I don't know what images are going to come in. And this is a you know, fundamental film idea that meaning comes from the juxtaposition. It's arguable, but Eisenstein was like, meaning cam- comes from the juxtaposition of two images. It's the in-between space where meaning is made. And true of editing in film too, right? Or in writing. And so to create a piece where that's actually being constantly disrupted and it's live even to the viewer, but also to me, was actually really interesting. So I just made that like last week. So I'm really interested in, in that as a jumping off point for playing with really how, you know, is film narrative anymore? I think we are experiencing images in a stream of film that we don't see images as still anymore. So the... The merging of photography and film is happening very quickly. That's really interesting. I mean, I've often wondered about your work is if there was any legacy of surrealism in there in the sense of that sort of juxtaposition of the unexpected or the, the symbolic and somehow the automaticness of some of it. And I wondered, is, is there any direct correlation with surrealism in your work? You know, Merritt Oppenheim, and I would take that. It's not going to be the artwork I choose, but um, <laughs> I think we're in a place where everything, there's a kind of an open field. You know, I did a few conversations with real painter painters, and they were asking me all these questions. Well, can you really do that? Can you use Lindsay Doyle this way? And I think surrealism is definitely part of what the conversation is right now, right? Because uh, I think that there is such a melange, there's such a, like, fundamentally that the idea of collage is actually the way we experience the physical and the digital and anything. It's constructive in deconstructive ways. I think we are experiencing the world in a collage-like sense. Um, and I think that part of surrealism is really important. Is there a particular discipline in your daily working life that you see as an essential ritual? So I I need to make something every day or I start to get irritable. 
I realize that if I'm getting irritable, I realize it just makes. So, you know, ideally that's going to be in the studio. I try and come to the studio every single day, or if I'm on site, I'm making work. Um, but I lived in Calder's studio in Sachet. And so I did a lot of research on him, you know, back in 2000. And I remember reading that he made so many works that if you divided them down to every day he lived, the day he was born, he made something. <laughs> and that ranged from, you know, earrings to spoons to rugs to, you know, his coat hanger, his bed. So it was, he was making everything. And also it doesn't have to be good. You know, work makes work, right? So every time you put something out there, it can bubble up in different ways. Um, so that for me is the one thing I try and do. That's what I try and do every day. If you could live with one work of art, what would it be? So I'm going to choose Las Meninas by Velasquez. <laughs> it's not a small work. I'd have to get a big <laughs> space. It might require a new new house. Um, but, you know, I almost feel like, you know, I don't even need to explain why. I mean, it's one of the most masterful paintings ever made and still is to this day. In, you know, the complexity, I feel like it folds out like an origami in terms of its composition um, to start on the left with the back of a painting, the ping ponging of the eyes to you, to, you know, to the back of the room, the way the light works, the lyricism of the people through it, the, you know, the, the precision, but also the complete mess of the composition, the completely disarming lighting in it. I'm not sure there's been a more important painting that can be made since. So I'll take it. Yeah, <laughs> you might have some competition, I think. Um, <laughs> but I, know, I suppose one of the great things about it is that it's probably the one of the most written about, explained, deconstructed paintings in the history of painting. And yet it remains utterly mysterious to this yeah. day. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a really important point about it. I, someone asked me when I first started painting again, they said, well, how did you know, like, you know, when to show the paintings? And I actually wasn't going to show them. I had a total studio of sculptures and I I actually made a sequestered studio for a long time where I made flat work and it was usually as gifts because when I would do a show for a museum they would say you know we need to raise money can you do a print because I've always been doing printmaking I've taught printmaking for many many years with Valerie Hammonds and Kiki Smith mm. and loved doing it but I had this room where I basically made flat works and so I was doing paintings and actually it was Victoria Miro who is well known for an incredible eye with painting and was a painter herself who saw them in her in her elegant way just said these have to be shown and so that was sort of when I pulled them out of the closet and you know, it was like I was pretending I was playing chess in there like Duchamp but <laughs> she somehow the door was open and I went to the bathroom and she saw them um, but someone said to me how did you know when the paintings were good and I said to them I knew when I couldn't explain them. And I feel like that's a very painting idea. Like you can talk about sculpture, you can talk about film, but when a painting is really good, it's actually very hard to articulate them. And lastly, what's art for? I think art is for sustenance. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. Sarah Z is at Victoria Miro in London from the 12th of October until the 6th of November. Her exhibition, Fifth Season, is at the Storm King Art Centre in New York until the 8th of November and Fallen Sky is a permanent work there. And Sarah Z New Works is at Gagosian in Basel in Switzerland until the 13th of November. And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. And do also subscribe to our other podcasts, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every Friday. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. Production, editing and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack and the producers of the art newspaper podcasts are Julia Mahouska and Amy Dawson. Thanks to Henrietta Benthel, Daniela Hathaway and Kabir Jalla. Huge thanks to Sarah Z. See you next week. Bye for now. This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.